You know, I remember the first time that I heard the name Emmett Till and it was this older lady who was telling me about the story, right? But what stuck with me for years was when she was telling me the story, she was very angry, like agitated or something, man, about what had happened to him. And that always stuck with me. I wonder how she's doing now. But, um, so look, I want to go back in time of the year 1955. So let's take a stroll through those days, y'all, and really find out what happened to 14-year-old Emmett Till. Now, Emmett Till was born on July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois. Now, see, his mother, Mamie, Mamie was, she was from Mississippi, but as a child had moved with her parents to Chicago during the Great Migration. Now, a little history underrated fact about the Great Migration. Um, the Great Migration was basically when millions of black people left the segregated South and headed North, really after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1863. And a lot of blacks left they left the south for protection they wanted better protection better jobs and living conditions but i'll break that down on a history underrated episode i've been promising y'all but anyway now when mamie was about 18 years old she met lewis till and they got married and then they had emmett till which would be their only child but the relationship between Mamie and Louis Till didn't last because he was cheating on her, he was abusive, and she had to put a restraining order on him, which led to the judge giving him the options of either going to jail for putting his hands on Mamie or he could enlist into the military. And he chose the military in which he later died in. But he wasn't killed in the war or nothing like that right he died by hanging he was lynched after he was accused of raping an Italian woman it was him and another guy they was hung by the neck and look the crazy part is when Lewis Till went to court right the woman that had been raped said that it wasn't Lewis Till that raped her and they still hung him because they needed somebody to put the blame on wow that's crazy and and look Mamie didn't even know he was dead until the money he used to send home to her stopped coming but anyway right now back to Emmett right now Mamie she had to raise Emmett as a single parent because the father he died when he was four so Mamie raised Emmett as a single parent but with the help of Emmett's grandmother which is Mamie's mother and when Emmett was about six years old, he ended up getting a disease called polio, which left him with a bad stutter. But, you know, for the most part, growing up, Emmett was a good, outgoing kid. He loved to play baseball, sports, ride bikes, fishing, uh, hang out with his cousins and friends. And they say he was a prankster, too, now. He loved jokes. He always was joking and having fun. They said he loved joking so much, he would even pay people to tell him a joke. That's just the kind of kid he was. Now, in 1955, right, for that summer, he went to Mississippi to visit some of his family members. And it wasn't his first time going there because, see, his great uncle Moses Wright, better known as Reverend Mose, or they used to call him Preacher Mose, he had came to Chicago for a funeral and Emmett's cousin, uh, Willa Parker, which is his uh, Moe's right grandson, was going back with Moe's to Mississippi for the summer. And when Emmett found out, he begged his mother to go down there for the summer with him. So, you know, like I said, he, he'd been to Mississippi at least four times and he loved going there to visit his cousins and family. And his mother, Mamie, she agreed to let him go, but she told him, she told Emmett to be careful because the South 
was a lot different from Chicago because at that time, it was the Jim Crow era. Racism was very bad down there. I mean, it was it was bad everywhere, but in the South, it was terrible. So she gave him the rules and told him to be careful down there, telling him if he have to get down on his knees and bow when a white person goes past, she told him do it willingly and say yes sir and no ma'am and please don't look white women in the eye be silent and be invisible wow it was bad down here y'all i'm telling y'all because look like 10 years earlier world war ii had just ended and a lot of the black soldiers from the south came back home and they were demanding equal rights so the racial tension was very high at the time and the year before, which in 1954, right, the Brown versus Board of Education had happened where the Supreme Court outlawed segregation, which had a lot of white people already mad. And they was feeling for the first time that blacks had the law on their side in the struggle for equality. And look, just a week before Emmett Till arrived in Mississippi, a black activist named Lamar Smith was shot and killed in front of the county courthouse for organizing and helping black cast votes. And they ended up arresting three white suspects for his murder, but they were released and never charged. And a month before that, in May 1955, a civil rights activist and preacher named George Lee was murdered for the same reason. He was helping black people vote. So... His mom, Mamie, she let him go down there. She let Emmett go down there. And everything was cool in the beginning. He got there and he helped his family pick cotton in the fields to earn some money. And But for the most part, though, he just played around, hung out, and just had fun with his cousins. I mean, he really didn't help pick cotton. I mean, he did it one day because Emmett said he couldn't stand the heat because it was just too hot out there. So he stayed home with his aunt, Elizabeth which is his grandmother's sister and Moses Wright wife. And he would just help her pump water, catch chickens for dinner, get dinner ready until his cousins came home from picking cotton all day. Now, after that, right, everybody came home from working, picking cotton all day long. So Emmett, his cousins and some friends had went to Money, Mississippi to a store named Bryant to buy some candy or whatever right and on that day only carolyn bryant she was working carolyn bryant she was a 21 year old school dropout with two kids she was working with her sister-in-law named juanita milam who was the wife of jw milam who was rory bryant's brother right now carolyn's um husband roy bryant was in there that day he was working out of town in texas that day so before i go any further right let's get into the background of the store owners then and who they are now carolyn and roy bryant at that time they say uh they was very poor they ain't have a car they ain't had no tv they ain't had nothing they was living in the back of the store with two kids but see, their store was basically a store for black people. And his brother, J.W. Milam, actually got the store for them. Plus, they had, you know, they had black employees working there also. And Carolyn would run the store when her husband, Roy, was working out on his other jobs. So, back to the story when Emmett came in, right? When him and his cousins came in. So, they get to the store... And Emmett's cousin Wheeler went in first, and then Emmett walked in. Now, Emmett's cousin Maurice sent his brother Simeon in with Emmett to make sure Emmett don't do nothing or say nothing crazy because they know how Emmett liked to joke around, but not everybody finds it funny. Plus, he didn't know, see, Emmett didn't know how the South operates, so. You got to behave and show manners when dealing with white people in the South at that time. Because look, they had to watch Emmett because days before when Emmett had arrived, 
he set off some fireworks in the city limits, which in the South you weren't supposed to do during that time. And he thought it was funny, but they could have gotten a lot of trouble for doing that. But anyway, so they're in the store and everything is normal. Emmett paid for his items and they walked out of the store, according to his cousins, Wheeler and Simeon. Simeon was in the store with him. So after that, they all leave the store and then Carolyn Bryant comes out of the store to go to the car. She went to her sister-in-law car and to get whatever. I don't, know, I don't know what she was getting. And they say that's when Emmett Till Wolf whistled at her. And when he did that, his cousins and all his friends became so afraid that it scared Emmett. Even Emmett realized he messed up. They looked at him like he lost his mind, man. You don't do that. They all jumped. Look, they all jumped in the truck trying to get out of town as fast as they could because you don't do that to no white woman in the South at that time. A black person was supposed to move when they saw a white person walking on the same street. And Emmett whistled at her. Wow. Now, they all jumped in the truck, trying to hurry up getting the truck. They left speeding, trying to leave the town of money, Mississippi, right? And while driving, they noticed a car behind them. And they thought it was Carolyn Bryant or her husband, Roy Bryant, following them. So they were scared. So what they did, they pulled the car over. They pulled the truck over and everybody jumped out and ran through the cotton fields. But the car that was behind them just kept going. So they just figured the coast was clear. The car that was behind them was a, a next door neighbor to them. And after that little, little thing, Emmett begged his cousins not to tell their father, Moses, which was his great uncle, that he whistled at Carolyn Bryant because... He didn't want to get sent back to Chicago. Now, the next day, their neighbor named Ruthie Mae Crawford had heard about what they did from her uncle because the word had spread and she told him that they may be some trouble. They might be in some trouble because they knew the Bryants. And they say people was telling him and the family like, yo, it's going to be some crazy mess behind what Emmett did. They even told Mose Wright, they say. And they told Mose Wright to send Emmett back to Chicago ASAP, but he didn't do it. But Simeon said nobody told nothing to their father, Mose Wright. So he, he didn't know nothing about it. And the crazy part is they say uh, Carolyn Bryant wasn't even going to tell her husband what had happened. But it was a black guy who ended up telling Roy Bryant what happened, saying it was a Chicago boy. Who did it and he was staying at Moses Wright house wow that's crazy she wasn't gonna say nothing about it but it was a black guy who ended up telling Roy Bryant what had happened in the store or whatever or he whistled at her whatever mm, 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 mm. now according to Emmett's mom Mamie she said uh she heard that Roy Bryant wasn't even worried about the whole incident at first until some unknown black guy kept pestering him about the situation. And look, and Roy Bryant, see, when the black guy was telling Roy Bryant and just kept pestering him about it, Roy Bryant had to do something now because somebody was, look, somebody was spreading it all around town. And if he didn't do anything, the white people in town would have looked at him like a coward. And that's when Roy Bryant told his brother, J.W. Milam about the incident. Now, let's get into who J.W. Milam was, right? Now, he was a wild racist guy. They say he was a plantation overseer who had a reputation in town to know how to handle black people, they say. They say he was a military vet who's been shot up before, shot all in the chest, whatever. He was a platoon leader. A street fighter good with using guns because he always kept a 45 on his hip. So, look, once Roy Bryant told his brother J.W. Milam, next thing you know, 
on August 28, 1955, around 2.30 in the morning on a Sunday, on a Sunday, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam showed up with guns at the home of Moses Wright. And you know what? In my opinion, they had to be drunk, man. You know, the research said they were sober for some reason. But I'm like, they probably was drunk. Now look, <laughs> so they banging on the door and Mose came to the door and then they tells Mose they want to talk to the uh, fat kid from Chicago who had a big mouth and a lot to say. And Mose let them in. They went through all the rooms. They had a flashlight because the house was dark. They went through all the rooms looking for Emmett. And they found Emmett and made him put his clothes on and told him to come on with them at gunpoint. Man. Now, they say uh, when they was asking Emmett questions, right? He wasn't responding to them, yes, sir. He wasn't saying yes, sir, to them. And that made him very angry. Because he was also taking his time putting on his clothes and shoes too. So they was agitated. And Moses and his wife Elizabeth, which is Emmett's aunt, begged, man. They was begging and pleading, trying to tell uh, Roy Bryant and J.W. Uh, Milam, yo, we'll send them back to Chicago. They was offering them money. Yo, just leave him alone. Let him go. Forget about the whole thing. He's from Chicago. He don't know nothing about the South. But, you know, look, when, when they said something about money, <laughs> Roy Bryant kind of hesitated and thought about it for a minute because he was about that money. He was poor. Like I said, they was poor. But the other guy, J.W. Milam, mm, his mind was already made up. And he told Moses, he told Moses and Elizabeth that all he was going to do to Emmett was whip him up. And bring them back. Plus, he told Moses this too. He told Moses, how old are you? And Moses told him, I'm 64. And he told Moses, if you want to live to see 65, you better not tell nobody that we did this. Wow. And when they left with Emmett, the only thing that his great uncle Moses could do or say was, hmm, hmm. Mm, mm, mm. that's sad man because Moses and his wife Elizabeth knew what kind of monsters these guys were and poor Emmett had no idea what he was dealing with I mean look they couldn't call the cops because the cops were racist too and Moses also feared for his life and his family and you know Moses and look Moses did say there was a black guy that came with them that was standing on the porch. Now see, that must have been the black guy from the store that told Roy Bryan about the kid from Chicago who whistled at his wife. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know. But look, Mississippi at that time, it was so dark, man. The country roads was dark pitch black at night. They couldn't see nothing. Plus, look, when they kidnapped Emmett, they had a flashlight because that's how dark it was in the house. Because Moses said the lights weren't working. And that's what Emmett's mom Mamie said in an interview. They was trying to find out who was this black guy standing on the porch. Like I said, it was so dark. You probably couldn't see who it was. But they wanted to know who was the black guy and the black man on the back of the truck when they took Emmett. Now, Moses also said... He heard a woman's voice coming from the truck saying Emmett was the one that was doing all that talking at the store. And, and many people believe that was the voice of Carolyn Bryant. And after that, like I said, they made Emmett lay down on the back of the truck. And they took off with him. Straight kidnapped him, man. That's crazy. And look, his cousins, you know, they really thought that they was going to bring him back. But the later it got, they realized that he wasn't coming back. And by that time, now everybody knew what was going on because it was morning. It was already 2.30 they came in the morning. And now as hours go by, the, the sun started to come up. And now the whole town know about it. And 
everybody's upset crying and everything and Moses and another guy they did go looking for Emmett they went out there to look for him but couldn't find him and that's when Moses said the only thing we can do was wait mm, 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 mm. sad man that's crazy and you know what Moses' wife Emmett's aunt Lizzie she was so upset that she left the house and went to stay with her family across town. She couldn't even take it. She couldn't take it, man. You know what? She never stepped foot in that house again. And that's when they called Emmett's mom, Mamie, and told her what had happened. But really, it was uh, Moses' other grandson named Curtis Jones. He was from Chicago, too. He was visiting. He was the one that actually called his mom back in Chicago and told her what happened. And then his mom got in contact with Mamie. And then they got in contact with the police in Mississippi. And that's when the sheriff from LaFleur County named George Smith questioned Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam about the kidnapping of Emmett. And, and look, they admitted, they admitted it. They took Emmett from the house but claim they let him go the same night in front of Roy Bryant's store. That's what they told the sheriff, but <laughs> they tried to say uh, they released Emmett after Carolyn Bryant said he wasn't the one who'd done all the talking at the store. And the sheriff still arrested them for kidnapping, though, because they admitted the kidnapping. So he arrested them because they admitted it, plus they had witnesses that saw them do it. So now, Let's get back to the morning they kidnapped Emmett, right? Now, after they snatched Emmett from the house, they took him to a barn of one of their uh, other brothers. J.W. Uh, Milam had another brother, Leslie Milam, had a barn, which was on a plantation southwest of Drew in the Mississippi Delta. And that's where they started to beat Emmett and torture him. So this is what they did to him, right? They stripped him naked. They beat him up like crazy, pistol whipping him, knocking him unconscious, broke his wrists, broke his leg, knocked his teeth out, choked out his tongue and stuffed it back in his mouth, crushed his skull, and they even gouged out one of his eyes. Now, hold up. I ain't done. I ain't finished yet. They say they also cut off his penis. Then they shot him in the head and then they threw him in the river with his neck wrapped in barbed wire and weighed him down with a 75 pound cotton gin fan. Mm, 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 mm. Now, a black guy named Willie Reed, right, who was 18 years old at the time, was walking on the road that day going to get something from another neighbor's house. And he said he saw a green 1955 Chevrolet truck passing by with two white men in the front seat. And he said he saw Emmett and two black men in the back. And he knew the two white men were Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam. And he knew who were the two black guys, too. They were Levi Tutite Collins and Henry Lee Loggins. And Willie Reed said... He could hear the licks they was giving Emmett's walking up the road. He said he didn't pass the house yet. He was coming up the road walking and he heard the licks. And by the time he got closer to the barn, he said he heard a boy inside the barn yelling, Mama, save me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Mm, 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 mm. He said he heard Emmett saying, Mama, save me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And you know when somebody call for their mama, you know it's over. It's over. You know you about to die. The only people that I heard and saw with my own eyes who screamed for their mama before they died were George Floyd when the cops had the, the knee on him. And Sean Levert, when he was in jail, and he didn't, and they didn't give him his medicine or something like that. That videos on those videos, both on YouTube. You can check those out. Now, 
back to Willie Reed, right? So he said he also heard the sounds of blows landing on a body and voices cursing and yelling, saying, get down, you black bastard inside the barn. And that's when he went to the neighbor's house and told her that he thinks J.W. Milam them are beating somebody in the back in the barn. So they wanted to see what was going on, right? So they walked back there and Willie Reed was acting like he was trying to get some water from the well near the barn. And he was looking and that's when he heard heard him beating Emmett and he was crying. And next thing you know, <laughs> J.W. Milam came out of the barn with a pistol and asked Willie if they had seen or heard anything. And at that point, they were scared for their life. And Willie responded to him saying, nah, we ain't heard nothing. We ain't seen nothing. So he kept on his way walking and he had to pass the barn to get to where he was going. And he said by the time he walked back, passing the barn again it was quiet now the barn was quiet when he walked back passing the barn and in his mind Willie said in his mind he was thinking they must have killed him mm. then he said then Willie said look he said he saw them put like a body into the pickup truck now another neighbor named Mary Johnson who lived beside J.W. Milam said they saw a fire in the backyard of J.W. Milam's house. They was burning something up, but they didn't know for sure what it was. But later on, they found out that they was burning Emmett's clothes. And another person said they saw J.W. Milam at a gas station the following morning. And they saw something bulky under a tarp in the bed of his truck. And blood was dripping from the tailgate. Now, after that, right, days later, the sheriff, who went by the name of Sheriff Strider, showed up to Moses' house and told them they found what they think is Emmett's body and needed Moses to come down to identify the body. Because what had happened was some boys who were fishing found a body in the river. So Moses went down there and the only way he knew it was Emmett was because he saw the ring that Emmett's father had given to him on his finger because he couldn't identify him no other way because of how badly disfigured the body was. And he said the smell was horrible too. Now look, the sheriff told Moses he want that body in the ground today. They was trying to bury it to that same day. He wanted an immediate burial because they didn't want nobody to see how badly mutilated Emmett's body was. They had already embalmed his body and had a hole. The hole was already dug in the grave, John. They was digging the they was digging the hole. And everybody, people actually showed up for the funeral and everything. And they say the smell was awful too. Because see, Sheriff Strider, he knew if this got out to the world, all the attention would be on Mississippi in the headlines. Now Curtis, right? Curtis Moses' other grandson, the one that called his mama to tell her what happened to Emmett. And then his mama told Mamie what was going on. So Curtis goes like this to Moses. You're going to bury Emmett and not tell his mama? And that's when Moses told everybody.